great. So we're uh, into the final uh, session, and we've got a, a, a real treat for you, actually. Um, uh, Sam Bell's um, The Golden Thread that's run right through Sam's career um, has been the a topic much discussed today, the interdisciplinary thread, including uh, most recently at the Santa Fe Institute. Sam was also, of course, uh, a founding father uh, of course. So, Sam, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Uh, it's great to see everyone here. And uh, the title of this session is, is um, the, uh, the Way Forward or Where We're Headed. And uh, I want to think back a little bit. I mean, it's so wonderful seeing all the, all the core people in this uh, room who were there right at the start. And I mean, we had no idea that we would be here. I don't mean here at the bank. I mean, we had no idea this thing would work at all. We had no reason to think that it would. It was worth a try. That's what we were thinking. Well, it, uh, it turned out to be really something, and it really, really worked. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's wonderful now to look ahead, because we can't just rest on our, on our laurels. Um, so um, let's think about, first, w what it is that we hope to have accomplished here. And uh, no modesty uh, at all. Uh, there was a big transformation in economics. It took place in, in the shadow of the Second World War, uh, the triumph of communism in uh, the Soviet Union, uh, and the Great Depression. Uh, it occurred because uh, the society itself was in a crisis, not just economics, but the society itself was facing a crisis. But there was also some new theory, uh, some new economics that was available in, uh, in Keynes' work and so on. Now, uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, what happened then was, of course, Paul Samuelson, a very young uh, professor at MIT at the time, uh, he sat down in the 1946 and 47. He took time away from writing his major theoretical work, and he wrote this mimeographed version of a textbook. It later became, of course, a famous uh, paradigm-setting uh, book, which you see there. Uh, this is what he said right at the beginning. The political health of a democracy is tied up in a crucial way with the successful maintenance of stable high employment and living opportunities. It's not too much to say that the widespread creation of dictatorships and the resulting World War II stemmed in no small measure from the world's failure to meet its basic economic problem adequately. Now, does that have a certain resonance with you today? Of course, that was really a kind of crisis we, which we are not now experiencing, but we could well find ourselves in a situation like that should we continue to not address the kind of problems that people here have been uh, discussing. Let's look at the book. Um, the, uh, that's the table of contents. And the, uh, almost everyone here has seen an economics textbook. I want, to note, I want you to notice a couple of things here. The first is that national income, the word macroeconomics hadn't been invented yet, national income, which means macro, is in the heading of all three sections of the book. Uh, the other thing you'll notice is the first section is basically about institutions and economic sociology. It's 200 some pages long. Uh, and then you don't go to micro to begin, you start with macro. Look at that. You only get to micro, look where the determination of price by supply and demand comes. That's chapter 19. Uh, so basically, the important stuff was brought to the front of the book. Uh, and um, uh, of course, the reason why I, when I was a grad student, I knew Samuelson, uh, the reason why I thought of him as being a terrible centrist, that was a terrible thing to be in those days, uh, was because he reversed the order of his book in, uh, in later editions and put the micro at the beginning, everything was you know, stabilized. Uh, um, uh, but at the time, he was considered to be a really drastic uh, radical. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, someone tried to get him kicked out of MIT and failed, of course. Uh, but um, what he said in response, this is directly in response to that attack on him, uh, the methods of analysis used are those that have been employed by 90% of the active academic economists under the age of 50 over the last decade. And that was probably true, because Keynesian economics became quickly very popular, at least in US. Uh, and it was, it was what basically people who were, who were on the go, rising people in the profession, were uh, then doing. Now, uh, I want to continue on this because this is the chapter 19. We finally got around to micro. Okay, starts on page 447. That's where you begin micro in his book. Um, uh, on page 447, on, oh, sorry, page 457, we learn that's all there is to the doctrine of supply and demand. <laughs> All it is left to do at some point is to point at the cases where it can be applied and some where it cannot. And by the way, he quickly goes on to say, you cannot apply it to the aggregate labor market. Uh, he says quite clearly, don't use this for the labor market, please. And so 
He then, by the way, this is a very brief uh, segment of his book. He, he brings out a lot of fantastically important points. He, economies of scale, that's part of his theory. If marginal cost is falling, competition tends to break down. So he already had a dynamic view that the com competitive process itself was unstable. Uh, and um, then he uh, gave us some terms. Uh, perfect or pure competition includes a few agricultural industries, monopolistic competition, most firms, and so on. Now, um, uh, just because uh, I'm a little dyslexic, so I have to actually do the subtraction, that's 10 pages. He devotes 10 pages to supply and demand and says that's it. Uh, and um, now, um, uh, the, uh, what he hoped to do there, and I think he did quite well, is uh, um, he said he, really, he wanted to address the really interesting and vital problems of overall economic policy, and that was, of course, the problem of unemployment. He was wildly successful, uh, displaced all other textbooks uh, um, for a very long period of time, and um, I think it's fair to say that the, uh, the education that he gave to the future lawmakers and journalists and opinion leaders of America was very important in guiding the, uh, the golden age of capitalism, which was something that happened in UK as well. Uh, and also, um, I think it was, we have a lot to thank him for because the fact that those ideas, the ideas that he put at the front of the book, the fact that they had become not just part of economics, but part of the economic vernacular, People talked about it as, well, that's how the economy works. I think we were saved from a very, very serious economic crisis 10 years ago because Paul Samuelson succeeded in changing how we think about and talk about the economy. Of course, now we're asking, is this another Samuelsonian 1948 moment? Uh, uh, I said that I thought he helped us avoid a serious economic crisis uh, uh, 10 years ago. It was serious enough, but it would have been much more serious had people not had the Samuelson, the Samuelson and Keynes ideas uh, uh, in their minds. Uh, but, you know, the, what Samuelson did, uh, if you want to think simply about what that book was, uh, 48, Samuelson 48, it was Marshall plus Keynes. That was it. Keynes, to get us to full employment, and then once we're there, Marshall. That's how, that's how Samuelson thought of it, by the way. That is, we have to get Keynes to get to the, uh, uh, what he called, the place where the classical verities would ring true again. That's quoting him, saying, well, use Keynes to get to where the old, the old time religion is going to be good enough. Well, it wasn't good enough to warn us about the financial crisis that would occur. Because having uh, achieved the great moderation, uh, the problem of the cycle and so on seemed to have been uh, slayed and uh, there was a, just basically we're in a Marshallian world where basically supply and demand does the job and there's a presumption that markets work pretty well. We have to have strong arguments for uh, doing anything else. Well, it's not just that, financial instability. It's also there was a mounting inequality uh, which uh, um, was occurring and um, so there were... Um, um, if I think were Samuelson around today, he would, uh, he would say, yes, we actually dealt with that problem pretty well in most countries, but there are some big ones now. And he would, he, I think he would sit down, well, he'd sit down with Wendy, and I think he'd write core with Wendy. He'd have, um, so uh, uh, we have a new set of problems. People have mentioned them. I'll come back to some of them. And we also have a new economics. Now, we don't have a Keynes. Uh, we don't have one book, uh, and we don't have a single crisis that, had, that made that book something everybody had to learn. Uh, but um, we do have some changes in economics. So when I say new economics, you might say, really? Uh, has economics really changed? Those of you who have been through undergraduate economics might, I think, be excused by thinking, no, not much has changed. Uh, but a lot has changed. So. Uh, a year and a half ago, Wendy and I decided, well, we wanted to see, in some empirical way, what really has changed in economics. So we took um, the, uh, the, the uh, articles published in the journals that you see between 1900 and 1915, uh, sorry, 1900 and uh, 2015, 27,000 articles in top journals. Uh, and um, we uh, wanted to ask, what are the themes? What's the language being used? Uh, and so we, we basically did what's called topic modeling. It's a machine learning technique. Uh, and we studied the content of these journals as they've evolved over time using this uh, statistical technique. Now, uh, I wish we had time to, um, uh, to explain it, but we don't. Uh, 
but basically the idea is you identify the, the, um, the coexistence of sets of words that you can identify pretty clearly as topics. Uh, that's why it's called topic modeling. And I'll, I'll give you an example of some of, them, some of them in the next slide. Once you have these topics from this vast corpus, then you can say, oh, well, where's the corpus going? That is, in the, in the 1940s, what were the topics they were doing, and so on. I'll give you an example from the field of micro, because I don't have time to do both. Um, but so we end up, we end up with 11,000 words, and we're now going to array them in, in vectors of words that tend to occur together. So here's an example. Uh, look over there on the left. Uh, topic 44, the numbers don't mean anything. They're just, we have 100 different topics. That's competition and market structure. And if you look at that, it'll be all kind of words like you know, supply and demand. And so it looks basically Marshallian. Uh, and so Wendy and I took these 100 topics and grouped them into meta topics. And these are three big types of, of uh, microeconomic theory. Topic zero, called market structure and competition, that's basically Marshall. Uh, and you'll see firm entry, elasticity, supply and demand, and so on. Uh, the middle topic is what we call individual level optimization. And as you can see, those are the topics you'd probably get in your second or third year micro class uh, about optimization. Um, and topic, uh, uh, topic two, strategic interaction and incomplete information, that's modern micro. That's basically game theory, uh, incomplete information. I mean, a lot of these ideas come from, by the way, the same era in which Samuelson wrote. When Samuelson was writing, also Hayek was writing about information and the lack and the fact that information is local and scarce. Uh, von Neumann was writing about game theory. Those were contemporaries of Samuelson, but those guys didn't get in Samuelson's text, and we had to wait, what, 70 years before we could actually take strategic interaction and the lack of adequate information, Hayek, von Neumann, Nash, and so on, uh, not to mention Schumpeter and, and others. So what we did is we arrayed uh, all of these topics into these, not all of them, the ones which were theory topics into these um, three categories. Uh, so this is going to be our map. These are going to be points in our map, and I'll show you what we have here. Um, this is called a simplex. It's called a unit simplex because the coordinates add to one. Uh, take a point somewhere in it, any point, and then ask yourself how close to a vertex is it. So, for example, if there's a point in this, in this uh, simplex which is close to the top, up there near the red zero, uh, topic zero, that would be very Marshallian. Or we, that, that's that topic which we called market structure and uh, competition. Uh, uh, so if you have a body of literature that's up there, you'd call it Marshall. And if you have a body of literature over there near topic one, that vertex, uh, that would be more like Hal Varian's intermediate micro theory book or something of that nature. Uh, and finally, uh, most of modern micro, uh, for example, Maskele, Winston and Green, the standard book for PhD students, now would be very much over towards the left to topic two. And um, so now um, uh, uh, ask yourself, uh, now, what we're going to do is we're going to map 15-year uh, uh, period by 15-year period, starting in 1900, we're going to map the history of economics. So now imagine, where is it going to move? We're gonna have to, you're going to see some arrows, and you can see things moving around in here. We haven't animated it. Okay, here, here's the history. We start off in 1900 with that red dot, and then notice the first thing that happens is Marshall takes over. Uh, it goes directly north up into the market structure and competition and so on. And so that's, um, uh, and interestingly, that's where a lot of the textbooks still are, unbelievably. But then, um, fr from then on, there is first a slow movement, then a pretty rapid movement down towards the topic one, uh, individual optimization. And that's where, I mean, I, I actually studied Marshall as a grad student, not in history of economics, but as a textbook. Uh, that was a very good book. Uh, I think it's very outdated now. But then what took its place was basically constrained optimization, algorithmic thinking, and so on. And that's moving there down towards the 70s and 80s. After the 70, 80 period, however, there's a very dramatic move over there towards the left and downward towards topic two. Uh, and that's basically these, the, the new economics, the kind of stuff that didn't get into Samuelson, but which we desperately need today to understand the kinds of problems we're engaged in. I'll have something to say about that uh, in just a minute. Um, now, um, economics has changed a lot, and uh, the intro course has not. Uh, and that's what CORE tried to do, uh, particularly in micro. 
where there was a lot of catching up to do, a lot of great micro was being taught at the grad level. Remember what Samuelson said, I'm just trying to teach what everybody under 50 already knows and that's what they're doing. And at least in micro, it's very much what we did is, uh, uh, it's update and you know we put game theory we put, we put behavioral economics we put capitalism as a system of institutions right at the beginning uh i think you've seen something like this uh, it wasn't exactly the same uh, look at the date this is uh, 2016 look at the month september that was before uh, one of the problems had been elected uh to uh, <laughs> uh, uh, uh the uh, uh when when these students are, are really outstanding they they really understand a problem when they see one uh, but um, uh, Wendy did the same thing uh, uh, three years later. That's three years later. Uh, and by the way, uh, this is very common. Look at that change. Uh, in three years, people are saying, no, wait a minute. We have, we, uh, we have a serious problem here. Uh, now, part of it's an illusion because there's, there's, a, there's a lot of uh, climate and environmental stuff in the top that isn't grouped into one th thing, but the word climate change became very important, so that's what a word cloud will do for you. It picks up things that, are, that we've, had, we've coalesced on. Nonetheless, that's a big problem, obviously. Uh, now, um, uh, this I got uh, um, the day before yesterday from PISA, uh, where core is being used. Uh, similar uh, thing, obviously inequality really big, but also sustainability and global warming, climate change, and so on. Um, um, the, the, if you look carefully, uh, the coronavirus is already also on there because this is Italy where it really is a problem. Uh, now, um, I want to suggest to you that climate change is today what the Great Depression was in Samuelson's day. Climate change is what's gonna force economics to change. Uh, now, I don't think it's inequality. Now, it's true. There's a lot of new stuff in economics. It's really fantastic for the, the analysis of inequality because we have principal agent models, the exercise of power between principals and agents, uh, borrowers and lenders, employers and workers, and so on. Those tools are getting into the economic uh, lexicon, both of experts and also a little bit more in the vernacular of what CORE is now teaching in the first year student, in the first year classes. But I think that's going to, this problem is going to be the thing that forces us as economists to really uh, change. Now, are we up to the task? Well, I think we are. I mean, economics has already moved over there towards topic two, and that's where you're gonna find the tools for dealing with the problems. Uh, namely, uh, if you think about it, uh, I mean, if we stay up in the, at the top of that simplex with Marshall, or in the right corner with basically constrained optimization with no content, and basically complete contracts and, equal, and uh, clearing markets, well, we'll probably won't make it there. But one of the characteristics of the lower left is it does supply some tools. Uh, uh, and as Samuelson said, uh, the, um, if, if you stay up in the top of that graph with Marshall or over to the right with Varian, right and lower, uh, you're leaving out most of what economists do when they do research. Uh, most of the methods that have been employed for 90% of the active academic economists under the age of 50. I don't know if that's a fact or not, but that gives you the idea that people who are doing economic research today are somewhere over there near topic two. Uh, that's where the research is being generated. That's what our to topic modeling analysis showed. So economics is there, but if you look at topic two, strategic interaction and incomplete information. Incomplete information, going back to Hayek and others, is really, really crucial because that's why we have ubiquitous market failures, incomplete contracts, the inability of any kind of intervention, either by trying to make the contracts more complete or, for that matter, government fiats. They also, that was Hayek's point after all, uh, uh, they're also subject to incomplete information. So what we get and what microeconomics at the graduate level has already accomplished is the essential role of institutions in mitigating market failures and other coordination problems. That's the first. The second is the rejection of economic man as the behavioral foundation for economic modeling, which is absolutely critical to facing climate change as a normative and policy problem. And third, a basis for the systematic understanding of not only the essential role of government, but also government failure. Uh, now, I want to say a little more about that. There's something odd about the standard intro text, whether it's Mann Q or Krugman Wells or whoever it is. 
Take Mankiw. Mankiw is known as a conservative. He's not very conservative. Uh, but what you'll find in intro text today is a naive faith that if you got a market failure, you just call the government. Uh, and I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, that was Marshall Pigou. It was very naive. It was a very, it was, a, it was I mean, I, I, I love that theory. But we've now got a long period of time noticing markets failing. One of the things they're failing at is dealing with climate change, but many, many other things as well. So in the textbooks, everybody knows what I'm saying. You'll find one example about rent control, and what a dumb idea that is. And I used to find what a dumb idea uh, the minimum wage was, but those are being taken out of the books now because it doesn't turn out to be true. Uh, but the rent control is going to be there. But you know what they don't have? They don't have a model that tells you why systematically governments fail. What are the problems that governments have? Information, motivation, the imperfect working of a democracy, and so on. That's not there. We absolutely need that, because if our governments continue to fail, we won't just be talking about market failure. We'll be talking about why didn't we solve this problem. Uh, so um, version 1.0 is what you see on the left. That's what you're familiar with. Uh, and uh, we just uh, made the uh, 2.0. One of the things, uh, all, all of you are probably writers, right, of some kind. And you get stuck and depressed. Well, what do I do when I get stuck and depressed? I make a title of the book. I, I, not just the title, I make the cover. And then it encourages me to continue on. Well, this is what we're, uh, we're trying to do. But we have to ask, is core up to the task? Because what I've laid out for us is a pretty hard job. Uh, now, let's go back to Marshall. Uh, as I said, I, I admire him tremendously. But do you remember what's on the title page? Natura non facet saltum. Uh, nature doesn't take jumps. Now, what? Uh, why is, I remember when I read it first, what? Why is that there? Uh, now, you know why it's there? It's he was doing marginal analysis, and he wanted to say, we've got smooth surfaces, and we're going to use the calculus to get all these results. And it was, it was brilliant. Uh, but that's what he was talking about. The fact, but I'm sorry, nature is getting ready to take some pretty big jumps. Uh, and we're facing that. And what it means for us is we have to think about what is non-marginal economics going to be like, where you have multiple equilibria and you, you could have uh, very rapid transitions from one basin of attraction, one equilibrium to another. Uh, we have to address this. And frankly, uh, we are as uh, awed by this prospect. I mean, the whole of us, the, the 15 or so in the room and everybody else is working on core, we don't know if we can actually uh, pull this off. But here are our plans. Uh, in 2.0, I'm not sure the kangaroo will be on the, on the, on the uh, cover, but I hope so. Uh, and that's not just because Wendy's from there. Um, the um, uh, 2.0 and in, uh, in ESPP, we're going to treat climate change parallel to inequality. Those of you who know those two books, you know inequality is a theme running right through all the chapters and so on, and students love that. And I think we showed that by taking a big problem, you can teach economic theory that way. We're not teaching about inequality primarily. We're using inequality to teach economics. That's the idea. And we think we can do the same thing with climate change, but of course, we're not sure. Uh, but the, uh, so that's the easy part, putting climate change at the beginning and carrying it through. But what's the hard part is, teaching the fact that we have both these smooth surfaces over which we can optimize, but we also have the danger of passing tipping points and then leading to cataclysmic changes which have a different kind of dynamic. That's, uh, that's going to be hard. Uh, that's a new set of theoretical tools. Everybody thinks, you're going to teach differential equations to first-year students? No, we're not going to teach that, but we're going to teach some very simple models which we think work, works. Here's one that's already in core sea ice in period T and sea ice in period T plus 1. The 45 degree line are stable points in which the sea ice is the same in the two years. Uh, the S-shaped function is a plausible function for any process which has positive feedbacks. Uh, like the melting of the sea ice, if it melts enough, then you're going to have an acceleration of the process of melting. So what this graph shows you, and we've shown you can teach this to students, is that there are three equilibria, uh, one with a lot of sea ice, one with very little, and an unstable one, labeled A there, in between. That's a tipping point. Then, as that S-shaped curve moves up or down, you may destroy the, the top equilibrium, and then you're really cooked. Uh, and so that's what we've done. Now, our idea is we only teach a model if there's a need to know. There's a need to know that model. 
but we only teach it if you can use it time and time again. So for example, here's the same model and it's about housing prices, bubbles. Uh, that works, I mean, it's exactly the same model. Uh, and that also works well. So that's what we're trying to do. Uh, that when we look ahead, the reason why we have every reason to be as, as, uh, uh, as awed by the prospect of what CORE is gonna do in the next seven years as we did uh, seven years ago is these are really hard problems, but we've got to do it and we need all of your help in doing it because it's really urgent and we think we can do it, but uh, we'll see. Uh, join us. Absolutely fabulous. Uh, we'll take um, three questions before we wrap up, if there are three questions. Could I ask you please to direct your questions to, to Wendy? <laughs> no, no, honestly, Wendy is leading this project. She is, it's unbelievable what she's accomplished. But uh, I've spoken on her behalf, and I, I think uh, if you have doubts or fears or ideas about what we should be doing, she's the person who's going to pull it off. Questions to Wendy. <laughs> yep, stop there. <clears throat> Hi again. Um, yeah, it was interesting to see your prioritising climate change over inequality. Linked to the previous panel about diversity, I just wondered, um, will something be included in the next version of CORE, which identifies reasons why climate change hasn't been such a big topic? <laughs> you know, in, say, like in, in economics, maybe, like, there's ideas about it being a race issue, or will it bring in ideas that uh, critique like Green New Deal, like ideas that say, you know, it's another form of green colonialism, for example. <laughs> Let's group the three. And yeah, take uh, Richard Davis. Um, it's a question to Andy. Uh, so it's a question to the whole panel, actually, which is we talked a bit about the uh, the sort of flow of students into economics. And now core's been going long enough that we should see students that have learned core go on to the PhD level. And one of the things I worry about as a, as a core trustee is that we're promising students it's, it's so exciting, there are so many examples and so on. And then they come up and slam against, you mentioned it, Sam, Maskell, Winston and Green, um, or Stokey and Lucas, these are the two graduate level textbooks, both of them like doorstops, both of them written in font size eight, full of maths. And I'm concerned that that puts people off at a further stage down the road. And I wondered, of course, there's a resource constraint, whether there could be a role for CORE providing some bridging material to take people from the end of the ex exciting stuff you guys are teaching into a research career so that more CORE students end up as researchers. There was one last question, just here, and then we'll go back to Sam and Wendy. Uh, so, Tanya Wilson from the Scottish Economic Society, and I'm just going to go and pick up on that point. I mean, it's not just the transition from the core level to the PhD level, but like, you know, if you're going from the core level to further along in either your undergraduate or your master's uh, degrees, one of the things that I have heard, we don't have it in the university that I teach in, is that it essentially does make the step from entry-level economics in your first year of undergraduate to your final year of undergraduate that makes that jump very, very large because of, of uh, for want of another word, the lack of rigour in, 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 in the core. So um, I'll go to Sam first and then let Wendy have the uh, final word. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I, I think um, the evidence suggests that students who did core as a, their first class do exceptionally well in the second year, better than people who didn't have it. Now, you may wonder, how is that true? By the way, I think to say this lack of rigor in core, have a look. Uh, uh, it isn't, uh, that's, that's not the case. Students find it very demanding. We have very good mathematical treatments on which you can click and so on. Uh, at, at UCL, the, the first group that came through CORE uh, the next year when they took their unaltered uh, intermediate courses, uh, they were just astoundingly good by comparison to previous years. That's not really very hard evidence, but it's a very good piece of evidence. I don't really know why, uh, but I think it's because we inspired students to really love economics uh, and, and to you know, have, a, have, have a reason to, 
to want to learn that, uh, that, that kind of thing. So um, I think that there is, however, the question of, well, you know, life after core. Uh, Wendy has an outstanding macro book, which is taught at UCL, uh, and which, which will be taught at second to second year students. Uh, as, as some of you know, and there is uh, a representative of OUP here. Uh, I'm publishing for very soon an intermediate microeconomics textbook, which is for second or third year students. Interestingly, uh, CORE is being used in a lot of places in the world for first and second year classes. Uh, it is 1,100 pages after all, and that's enough for a lot of classes. Uh, it's also being used at upper level uh, courses. But um, what we had hoped initially was not that our work would be used in those subsequent classes, but instead, uh, if you have masses of students who've had this first course, uh, and they love economics, but they don't see something like it in the curriculum, they're going to start making waves and try to make, try to make sure that happens. Um, uh, and I don't, I don't know if that will happen. It'll probably happen more in some places than in others. Uh, and there are a lot of other, I mentioned Wendy's text in mind, there are a lot of other things that are either already out or going to be out, which are just vast improvements over Pindic and Rubenfeld and Varian and the, the standard other equal books in, in, in macro. Wendy, over to you. So I think the first question um, at the top was, was really bringing together inequality and climate change. Mm -hmm. And that is very much on the agenda. And in a way, we're kind of perfectly um, uh, cited to, to do that in the 2.0. Um, in ESPP, as those of you who've been using it, already has a deeper treatment of climate change uh, than the economy. So you know, there's a kind of continuous um, movement in, in that direction. Uh, this, the question of um, the kind of pathway of students through their undergraduate degree into graduate work, PhD becoming um, research economists, uh, I think it's, 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 it's interesting to think about where, where intervention along that pathway is possible. But one of the things we've noticed with, um, in many universities, not just uh, UCL, we have some students here from UCL who could also probably um, comment on this, but uh, is that teaching economics the way we do in core, starting with complex problems and then uh, stepping back and, and teaching the tools that give you a lens to have an analytical grip on those complex problems, that ha has in the experience of many people using it, triggered economic research activity by students very early in their undergraduate uh, careers. So we are seeing first year students, second year students, there's a conference going on at this moment um, at UCL where those very students are presenting their own original research projects. And to at least to some extent, that I think is stimulated by the kind of work they encounter in, uh, in core because they realize that if they have a question they're curious about, then they will do the same thing. They will then step back from that question. So for example, understanding the motivations of combatants in, uh, in armies and civil wars was one of the uh, research projects presented at last year's undergraduate conference. Step back, think of how you can use the tools you've encountered in economics to shed light on that problem. So I think in we, 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 there is the potential for creating a kind of pipeline of students who are, who are drawn to economic research who would not otherwise have been, done, have, have been drawn to it. And then the question is, how do we ensure that they stick it out? Because they do have to go through uh, some tedious stuff of acquiring tools, which is always true in, in later parts of uh, research training programs in whatever subject it is. So there's always the, you know, the putting your head down and learning the tools to master the tools, whether that's learning coding or uh, econometrics, learning to use mathematical modeling to allow you to create a little laboratory to run simulations in. So I think our hope is that we're creating the motivation and we're also creating a kind of selection of students into doing research economics that would not have been drawn to it, and that they will have the kind of willpower, the staying power to stick it out when they have to do uh, the, the more tedious uh, kind of uh, mechanics of learning techniques that they'll need along the way. 
And uh, you know, we don't know that that's going to work, but we can we can all push in that direction. And on that. Why don't we, um, we should draw things to a close. Let me just uh, end by, first of all, thanking Sam again for, as ever, an absolutely brilliant uh, presentation, Sam. To all of you uh, for coming along uh, this afternoon, uh, for all the support that you provided uh, to CORE uh, over, the re over the years. Your reward for that, in addition to the food for thought you've had all afternoon, is that there is some food downstairs, and indeed some wine as well. Uh, don't raise your expectations too high. This is the Bank of England, for God's sake. But it is down there. Uh, and most is, is, is edible. Uh, and finally, uh, last but in every respect not least, to Wendy. Uh, for not just for organizing and orchestrating uh, today, but for all you've done uh, with CORE uh, over the years. Uh, you've changed the conversation uh, about economics, not just in the room this afternoon, but outside of it, over so many issues. So I think on behalf of everyone in the room, uh, let's thank uh, Wendy. That's enough. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, thank you, the core team who's helped put this on. Sandra Mills at the bank, who's just done an amazing job in getting us all here and having things work so smoothly. To Kim, who's up in the uh, uh, handling the audiovisual side of things, a big thank you as well. And to Andy for welcoming us, making us feel so welcome here at the bank, and for really pushing uh, in very much the same direction as we're all trying to push. Thank you.